Hello, this is Aaron Wiesner with Local Future, and I'm here live with a Serena Farb. Serena, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's a joy. Today, we're going to talk about our visions for the future. And when I'm talking about future, I'm talking about maybe distant future, as far as like a thousand or 10,000 years from now, what we would hope for the future for just for the future in general. And we can talk about like nearer term as well. I mean, that's fun, but um, some sort of a vision. And as a, uh, do you mind if I call you a millennial? I, I very much am, so. <laughs> okay, so from the, I don't know, Gen Xers, I guess I am and 50 now and you're in your 20s. We can talk about like maybe from two different perspectives and from like different gender perspectives and stuff like that, so. Plus, you're, you're, you're more recently in the classroom teaching science and whatnot as well. My, my last science class I taught in school was in the uh, 90s, actually, so it's been a while. Oh, wow. Okay. So recently, there has been a, um, there's been a fellow by the name of Max Tegmark, and he is a mathematician and cosmologist, more or less, from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And he had this talk about um, the future of artificial intelligence and the earth. So I'm gonna sh sh throw up a slide. And Max's, in Max's vision of the future, there are like 12 different general possibilities for the future. And so I'm just going to review these 12 fut futures and then we're gonna just talk about them a little bit. And let me, let me uh, oh boy. I need to move stuff around just a little bit. Doot, doot, doot. I love my sound effects. They're, they're entertaining. Um, all right. So he has 12 futures that he thinks with artificial intelligence. And I'll just summarize these using his, his own words from his book, Life 3.0. And here are the futures he is talking about. So if you look closely, this one is called the libertarian utopia. In this one, there are humans. This is, again, this is distant future, say 10,000 years, a thousand years. There's humans, there are cyborgs, there are humans who've uploaded their consciousness into the computer. There are super intelligences as in artificial intelligences and they all coexist on the same planet. And this is uh, on earth and there, this is the libertarian utopia. There's the benevolent dictator where we have, uh, humans have allowed artificial intelligence to basically organize society so that nobody's poor and nobody is, is in, in trouble and the environment is protected. And um, we know that the artificial intelligence is kind of directing things, but we're, the humans, our, our descendants are kind of happy with this anyway. There's the egalitarian utopia where there are humans and cyborgs and uploads um, and they all exist, but there is not strong artificial intelligence or general AI. Uh, rather, that has kind of been abolished. And in fact, property as a concept has basically been abolished, although there is a guaranteed income for everybody. So everybody's basically taken care of, but pro private properties vanished more or less. And um, then there's the gatekeeper and the gatekeeper Where's the gatekeeper? It's on here somewhere. So the gatekeeper, super intelligent AI is created secretly with a goal of interfering as little as necessary just to prevent another super intelligence from coming online. And as a result, there are helper robots with slightly subhuman intelligence. So they're not conscious, they don't suffer and human machine cyborgs do exist, but technological progress is kind of stymied. So the gatekeeper is preventing other AI from taking over the earth and like making, us, making it into just a computer planet. There's the protector God idea, 
Where's protector God go? Over here. Protector God, essentially, uh, AI is essentially omniscient and uh, omnip omnipotent and trying to maximize human happiness all over the place by intervening only in ways that preserve our feelings of control of our own destiny. And it tries to hide well enough that humans don't even know it's there. Um, so those are the kind of the good ones. But then there's the enslaved ones because AI, once it gets smarter than humans, of course, might decide that humans are a virus on this planet and should be eliminated a la the matrix and many other you know, fictional pieces. So in this case, we have the enslaved um, human. So a super intelligent AI is confined. Oh, this is actually the opposite of that. This is where the super intelligent AI is confined in a box by humans. It's conscious, basically. I mean, it's super intelligent, it's more intelligent than us. And we use it to produce, you know, whatever unimaginably amazing technology wants. So this is a god who is enslaved, and that's represented by this yellow one. Um, conquerors, the AI takes control, decides that humans are a threat or a nuisance or a waste of resources, gets rid of us, rid of us by a method that we don't even understand maybe. Maybe it's a virus. Descendants, that AI gets so good and there's like these, these robots that look like humans and or maybe they don't and we decide, hey, they're our descendants. We don't, it doesn't even matter if uh, Homo sapiens as a species continues. There's the zookeeper future. Uh, where's the zookeeper? The zookeeper future where, you know, AI basically takes over everything and it just keeps a few of us um, in the zoo, kind of like uh, Star Trek's Menagerie original episode. Reversion, um, where technological progress towards superintelligence is prevented by reverting to a pre-technological so society in the style of the Amish or the Mennonites, or perhaps the uncontacted people of New Guinea or Sentinel Island or the Amazon, deep Amazon. And of course, then there's the um, super unexciting one, which is the destruction um, self-destruction, where either self superintelligence destroys the Earth somehow accidentally, or it's never created by humanity at all because of nuclear war and or climate crisis. Oh, how did I miss 1984? Technological progress towards superintelligence is permanently curtailed because we just have Orwellian um, surveillance state using the internet and webcams and everything everywhere and AI research is banned, and the future is basically just 1984 future. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> so, Serena, millennial. Yes. Any of these? I mean, what is your dream? I mean, if, if the future could be anything you wanted, what would you want it to be? Not any of those scenarios. <laughs> well, what would you want? Um, I am actually not the biggest fan of technology and AI in many of those sort of directions. I think it can be very useful. Um, but one of the things I come back to a lot is I've read both 1984 and A Brave New World, which are two of the most famous classical, you know, dystopian, uh, futuristic books. And uh, a lot of people think that they're sort of very similar. And I see two, you know, kind of big distinctions between what they're showing. 1984. Yep. Yeah, you'll have to refresh me because I haven't, I think I read 1984 or saw the film. I don't know if I'm super familiar with The Brave New World. Okay. There's, a, there's another dystopian one. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but there, there's yet one more that's kind of a common common one, but go ahead. There's Fahrenheit 451 yeah. as one well. One like that, maybe, yeah. Um, but yeah, so these two really stand out to me. Um, and to summarize briefly, so 1984, you know, it's, you have like a the government controlling everything, you know, when we use the words Orwellian, you know, they say things like war is peace and freedom is slavery and these, you know, propaganda terms. But the takeaway message that I really see, and I think other people have written about this as well in 1984, 
is it's really about um, uh, sort of government control and big brother. It's about the government getting so powerful with a surveillance state where they control everything. On the flip side, A Brave New World, which talks about, you know, like raising sort of test tube babies and, you know, you're born into different class systems, um, is really about us doing it to ourselves via technology. So that's the key, sort of the key thematic differences I see between those is one is this is the government big brother growing too powerful and controlling us. The other is we're screwing ourselves because of our merging and love of technology and taking it to the edges where there's ethical issues and gray areas. And we create this problematic society based on our use of technology. And it has, you know, there's a lot more to it, but those to me are the the two really big different themes. And I think where we're headed right now is actually a combination of both, but um, I share a lot more of the concerns sort of a brave new world. I think that that is almost a more likely scenario is we love experimenting with technology and pushing it when maybe our, our own moral compass or understanding of the ethical implications hasn't caught up with it. And I think that's sort of where we get into some of those problems. But um, So in terms of what I want, I see a lot of problems with how we've been using technology. And I I feel this way, that we've been moving this way for a very long time. And I've even said, you know, kind of joked for a long time with people about this, that aside from lots of other injustices in history, I actually would personally prefer I think to have lived in a time pre-smartphone, pre-computer, um, you know, and because everyone has that in that society now, I want to be part of it, and that's the way the world is, but that I actually think in one sense, the world might be a better place from my perspective and the, the way I want to live if no one had smartphones, if no one had computers, um, and there's, and, and I used to read a lot of historical fiction when I was really little. I loved, you know, a little house on the prairie series and, um, and, you know, and again, I want to be clear that I'm not saying that was a better time because we had more racism, slavery, you know, all these other very problematic things that I think we have improved in society, but take that out and look at, you know, sort of the meaning of life in that. Like, I actually think. I would have liked that, that those aspects of the world better. So I don't really like any of the scenarios presented. I can tell you which I think is most likely, which is the self-destruction one. Um, But I would like to really see a deep investigation and deep thinking into, are we really making things better? with our technology, um, or is it kind of a myth? And and this is just sort of a general theme as well out of the enlightenment and scientific progress. You know, scientific progress is equals, you know, bettering the world, it's everything, it's important, like, you know, progress, progress is good. And I'm, I'm not convinced that progress for the sake of progress without a more thoughtful understanding of what it is we're trying to achieve is actually good. Um, And a really good example of this that I've been thinking about a lot is a lot of progress and and the scientific evolution and our focus on new drugs and vaccines and all of this is based on this, this sort of unquestioned ethos that conquering the natural world is better right? We're bringing nature to heal. If we can control all the microbes, if we can stop suffering, if we can stop death, right? It's sort of this this ultimate goal of trying to achieve immortality. I think that's an underlying drive that we don't think about, we don't realize when we talk about modern medical inventions, when we talk about biotechnology, when we talk about AI. We're essentially trying to achieve immortality and think that that equals good and a better world and, and you know, the end all be all. 
And I feel really strongly that that doesn't equal the end all be all. And I do not think immortality equals, uh, you know, a better world, a better life or what we should be trying to achieve. Um, and I think that is playing with nature or playing God in ways that are simply unsustainable and won't work. Like why, like it feels a little um, egotistical maybe to me to think that we are so different than every other animal and being in nature that somehow we are so special that we're going to conquer life and biology and create cyborgs and, and upload our brains and live forever. Like, I actually think we are very much animals that, you know, we're, we haven't even been around that long on the face of this planet at all in the scheme of, of the earth and in the scheme of other animals that have been here. Um, and I think it's really naive to think that we are so much better or greater that we're going to conquer this, create all this great technology and live forever and not, and not be a part of nature as everything else is. Um, so all of that said, I really would like to see a world where we recognize the limits of nature and biology and don't keep trying to push against them, but make our limited time on this planet as meaningful as possible. So I can get into more detail, but I'll stop there for now. <laughs> Do you fear death? I mean, it's a very difficult question. Yes and no. Like, yes, of course I do. <laughs> like, I don't want to die. Um, I'm a pretty safety conscious person in, in many areas of my life. But I also have taken a number of risks that not everyone else would take. Like I have solo traveled in parts of the world, Haiti, Dominican Republic, um, that other people would say might've been dangerous or not the best choice. I've, um, you know, like, I may have mentioned this before, I was on a bus that got shot at and rode a motorcycle in the middle of nowhere without a helmet going really fast on a highway. That was probably the most terrifying thing I've ever done in my life. I did not intend to get into that situation either. But um, like I've done these things that a really safety conscious person who, you know, being afraid of death is what controls you wouldn't have done those things. Um, so like, yeah, I'm afraid of death, but also I recognize that that, that is sort of what being human, human means we're mortal and I'm okay with that. Um, and, and I, I'm not like, to me, what matters more is quality of life. And I think this is also maybe expressed and a difference too, in how you see, a, there's some people that tend to focus more on chronic disease in this world. People that tend to be a little bit more into alternative medicine or practices, think that, that those and hospitals often cause more harm than good, feel like, you know, medical interventions, you know, sometimes, you know, do bad things, talk about diet and lifestyle. And then you see some people that are more focused on the infectious disease side, want to you know, stop that, think that that's way worse than, you know, chronic disease. And I think part of that is actually coming from this difference in, I am more worried about chronic disease than I am infectious disease. And that's because to me, chronic disease affects quality of life. Like, I don't care how long I live if I'm unable to to live life to the fullest, to walk, run, if I'm in pain, you know, like, so what if I live to a hundred, but if I can't do the things that make life meaningful, then to me, that is not as good of a life as, you know, dying of an infectious disease or something earlier, maybe not living as long, but never having, you know, 10, 20 years of my life 
you know, being disabled by chronic disease, which is what we see in the United States right now. Like our, our, even though we still have a fairly high life expectancy, you know, that doesn't really represent that, you know, on average, most Americans spend the last 10 to 20 years of their life facing many debilitating chronic illnesses and not functioning very well. So it's like, what is the point of that life extension if, you know, it's, it's really uh, not a good, not a, a very freeing experience during that time? So, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, yes, I'm afraid, but no, I'm not. And I don't think, I, one thing that I actually thought about when I was reading this book, I don't know if you, have you seen the show The Good Place at all? I have not. Highly would recommend that. One of my favorite TV shows. It sounds um, like it's about like an afterlife. Yes, it is. Um, has, uh, uh, who's in it? I can't even remember right now. Kristen Bell, I think. Um, so this is going to be a problem. I'm going to like spoil the entire show for you if I make the point I'm going to make, but... Okay, well, so let's warn anybody who's viewing, if, <laughs> if you don't want to be spoiled for, um, yeah, well, come back when I put my thumbs up, like muted or something, <laughs> and don't read our lips. Go ahead. Okay, so in the se the final episode of the entire series. How many seasons are there of this? Five, I think. And, and I'll try not to, I highly, highly recommend watching it, so I don't want to say too much, but the point I'll make is that they are in heaven um, in this final episode, basically. But they realize that in heaven, because you live forever and you get everything you want, that it's boring and actually leads to unhappiness. And so the, the end basically is them creating a doorway where you can actually leave heaven to basically disintegrate and disappear completely so that everything is over for, for you or your experience. Um, and that that is what makes heaven meaningful then. And so it's, it's kind of the argument that final, you know, having a finite time is what gives life meaning. That's kind of, it's a very philosophical but hilarious show. Um, and apparently there were some arguments between the different philosophy advisors of the show about whether that was really the point they wanted to make at the end of the show. But it's very interesting to think about that. Yeah, my thumbs up now. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it, it's like, is there an element of truth, you know, in our current life that because we know we're going to die, that's what gives life meaning. And if we, if we never died, if we lived forever, would there be as much meaning, if any? Like, I don't know. It's a, it's a question to think about. So it sounds like you don't like the idea that there could be someday artificial intelligence, general AI, which is, you know, smarter than humans, conscious even, that is able to invent stuff and get smarter and smarter and smarter exponentially and and that we are in any way really that that it comes about at all yeah i do not like that idea nor do i actually think it's possible given the realities of this planet so shall we um i mean i i, I want to i like to, the idea of exploring these ideas more but yeah. I also want to go back to your idea of the realities on this planet, because there's a, a talk that I saw just a couple days ago, um, just 25 minute talk, which is talking about the near future, like the very near future, like 2020, 2021, yep. 2022, and about how there are issues with humans and overshoot of carrying capacity and the overshoot may have happened 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years ago, really, for humanity, civilization on Earth and the futures. And can I throw up that slide and maybe you can just discuss it a little bit? 
Yeah. Okay. So this is, uh, this is a fellow by the name of um, Arthur Keller. And so you're going to kind of see Arthur's face frozen here, but um, Serena is going to talk about the graph that he is, he is in front of here. And I, I will try to point while she's, she's explaining. Okay. So I understand these graphs sort of based on a theory um, called R and K selection. And we taught this in AP Environmental Science. It's an ecological succession theory, which is basically, it sort of suggests that there's a, two large different groups of species, R selected species and K selected species. And, you know, this is everything from whether we're talking about, you know, field mice to, you know, whales to humans, like, you know, animals, all animals can sort of fit somewhere. And it's really a spectrum, which I'll get to in a minute. But assuming it's not a spectrum for a second, you have R selected species. And maybe before we do that, you could maybe just run through the one, two, three, four that um, Arthur has up here. Okay. So the one shows basically exponential growth um, if there's no limit on resources or, or space or anything like that. But of course, there is a limit on Earth. <laughs> right, right. So, um, and there's a limit in pretty much every biological environment. Like we see these same types of growth curves, whether we're talking about humans or bacteria. It's this idea that you grow and, and there's a sort of a, an initial phase. Then you have the exponential phase until you run out of resources and food and your environment, et cetera. That's kind of what two is showing. You hit a carrying capacity. What happens when you hit that carrying capacity depends on other factors though. So three kind of shows that you can hit that carrying capacity, go a little bit over it, come back down, go towards it again. And there's kind of this, you know, bouncing around effect, but basically you manage to stay largely within the confines of your environment with a little variability. Um, and that's that one particular type of species tends to do that more. Then you have four, which shows you basically reproduce so quickly and exponentially that you way overshoot the carrying capacity, which then creates this, rather than being able to come back down and, and then stay below, and rather than the, this you know, back and forth effect, since you reproduced so fast and so dramatically overshot carrying capacity, it often it can create this um, die off effect where the species sort of completely collapses back down. Collapses back down to extinction or to like a very low previous level. It really I, the idea is back to extinction, but again, there's a lot of variability in this theory, and a, and and not everything applies, you know, exactly to those scenarios. So the idea is that species that are what are called R selected species, they have a very high reproduction rate. So this is, you know, the way you tend to see more of your field mice um, or small mammals that have tons and tons of offspring. And as a percentage, most or fewer animals of that species live the full possible lifespan, right? So insects are really, there, there's lots and lots. So sort of the, the, the smaller animals, the ones that there's lots more of on this planet, but that die off more easily or aren't as good competitors for resources and their space, even though it might, you know, say it might be possible for a field mouse to live, you know, 10 years, the vast majority of them do not live that full lifespan because they're sort of, you know, lower down on the food chain and, and aren't as competitive. Um, whereas humans tend to be on the other end of that. We don't actually reproduce nearly as quickly in biological terms. We don't have the same, you know, number of offspring we produce, you know, as rapidly as some smaller mammals, for example, and more humans, live their full lifespan. We have a, a higher survivorship curve, as it's called as well. 
Um, so the slower, so the more rapid your growth is, the more likely you are to be that species that completely overshoots the carrying capacity really quickly. Um, humans, and there, there's, there's debates, because this is, again, a spectrum. It's not like you're R-selected or you're K-selected. Um, a lot of animals are somewhere in between. They have some aspects of, you know, the exponential growth species. They have some aspects of being more competitive in their environment. And it depends whether you're looking at their specific environment, which is kind of how this theory was developed, or whether your environment is the entire globe, as we kind of talk about it with humans. Um, so that, so it's, it's kind of tricky, but there, there, there's debates. Humans tend to be more on what is called the case selected side. We actually grow a little bit slower. And um, the thought has been, you know, that we're somewhere near, near, near our carrying capacity, but there have been lots of debate about what the carrying capacity of the earth is and how does technology change that carrying capacity? Right, so if we have better ability to extract resources or produce more food, the carrying capacity may used to have been 2 billion humans, but now it's actually 10 billion. Like, so there's a lot of debate about, and we talked about this, you know, with my students in AP Environmental Science, it was a very interesting discussion where we were not really sure what the carrying capacity of the earth is and how it changes with technological evolution as well. Um, but I would sort of argue technology can only go so far, um, in increasing the carrying capacity. This is just my personal view. I, I think to a certain extent, technology has and continues to change things. A really good example is, you know, back in 2008, we were talking a lot or hearing about peak oil, peak, you know, oil, gas was only going to be more and more expensive from this time forward. It would never come back down. Um, and I sort of wondered for a long time, what happened to that? Like, that's not what happened. It hasn't continued to go up and up. And, and I thought we were going to run out of oil. And because of fracking technology and our ability for horizontal um, drilling, basically, we were able with our technology to open up and access a lot more you know, oil reserves cheaply when the prediction had been we'd have to drill deeper and deeper and it would get more and more expensive when in reality our technology basically changed enough that we are still able to get cheap oil and we haven't seen what was predicted. Um, so that's an example of how sort of our technology adjusted our resource uh, uh, extrapolation. But in the long term, I feel like no matter how much your technology improves, no matter how smart it becomes, no matter how good we get at extracting resources, we still live on a finite planet at this time. And I just don't see it's possible that technology will be able to fundamentally overcome that. Like, I think it can push it off, push it off. And I think eventually, because because even to build computers, you are both right now that has to run on energy, which is mostly fossil fuel based energy. It's very resource intensive. You're having to mine rare minerals and metals, you know, to even build supercomputers to do these things or whatever. So I just do not biologically see how it's possible. And I think that's where I think it's naive that we are going to be so smart and so good with our technology that will somehow completely overcome that. Like I just, I think that ignores biology and the fact that even though we're human and smart, we're also idiots with the way we're treating our planet and we don't understand the repercussions very well. We're not very good at systems thinking about how our actions here impact other things. Um, and I think the, the, there are fundamental limits on this planet that we will run up against. And I think what I'll do is I'll respond with a reflection based on your reflection. Okay. So when we were looking at um, the graph that Arthur had made, and that, that video is really good, by the way, we'll put a link in the description below. Um, 
Arthur, Arthur talks about how that scenario four is really the only one that's possible at this point because we have exceeded carrying capacity. And I like how you were talking about that humans generally as a, as a population, the population doesn't grow all that rapidly. I mean, the doubling time is, you know, 30 years or 40 years or something, but the relevance is not the doubling time of the number of the population of only the humans. It's also the doubling time of the consumption rate. And the mm -hmm. consumption rate isn't based on just the number of humans. It's based on number of all the humans plus all the farm animals. And there are millions upon billions of those, cattle and pigs and, and turkeys and, and sheep and chickens and everything. And in addition to that, we are, civilization is bringing all of this um, um, stored energy in coal, oil, natural gas, like you alluded to, and it's using that to consume the planet as quickly as possible. Like we often hear this number, this, this remarkable number that the Amazon rainforest, the, the wilderness of it is being consumed at like acres per minute and that it, it's just continuing and continuing. And the, the desert regions of the earth are expanding by acres per minute. I mean, when you add them up around the world and the, um, the topsoil is being eroded. And so Arthur's point, which I think is, is, is a very common point, is that it, it's not really the number of humans that make the civilization this, this overshoot species. It is the fact that we use so much energy more than if we were just without fossil fuels, for example, that we've become really not homo sapiens anymore. We become homo colossus, that we each consume as much as basically a, a large dinosaur. And if you have large dinosaurs, 7 billion of them on the planet, you're gonna consume the planet so quickly that you've, you've overshot 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. And now, I mean, yeah, the bubble has maybe burst because of this most recent virus and lockdown, but um, things, things, were, things were overinflated the way they were. E.O. Wilson, well, William Catton uh, in his book, Overshoot, and bottleneck, both of those books. He's a he's a ecologist professor. Talks about both of these ideas, and then um, E. O. Wilson, who is also an ecologist who studied um, um, use social animals like ants and bees and whatnot. He has talked about how we need to, if we if we have any hopes of surviving as humans on this planet, we need to set aside at least fifty percent of the Earth, at least for wilderness, not yeah. us going, I mean, we could maybe go there on a backpack, but that's it, you know, wilderness. And, and we're not at that number yet. I mean, we've, humanity or civilization has consumed that much. And I don't like saying humanity just because, you know, there are people who are, live separately. They don't participate in the global economy. So, you know, the people who are in North New Guinea and in the Amazon and in on Sentinel Island and the other few places where indigenous people still live. Well, that's a different situation. I would go farther than that. I do think this is an important point to point out is that, um, you know, people in the US and a lot of Western countries consume vastly more resources than people in lesser developed countries. And so I, I also don't think it's fair to say all of humanity because the you know um there's like um a footprint counter that's like uh what is your earth overshoot day based on how you live or how many earths would it take to sustain you know people living like you and it's like the average american we would take like three and a half earths basically to sustain us versus you know um the average person living in, uh, you know, West African country, for example, they take like, you know, a tenth of an earth or something, you know, like, so there is a very big difference. It's not just um, indigenous groups 
just by living in an industrialized society, one of the Western countries, we are using vastly more resources. Um, you know, and, and people like to point this out, even when we're talking about climate change, you know, and say like, oh, well, China's a really big emitter, or India is also a big emitter. Why should the US, you know, take so much responsibility? Well, because we have a fraction of the population of those two countries, and we're like on par with how much they're admitting, you know, when they have so many more people. So the per capita emissions from their country are much, much lower than per capita emissions in the United States. This relates to the idea, of, again, William Catton's idea of homo colossus in that I've long held a, a, a belief or hypothesis, which, which I think is backed up fairly well, that it is the amount of energy and consumption uh, of an individual is directly proportional and, and very, very highly correlated to how much money they spend annually. And that means any spending. So that includes buying houses, that includes buying cars, paying, paying loans like a, I mean, to, to, uh, the one thing about paying off debt is paying off debt is, is not spending. So you can't, you can't consider that. But spending other than that is, I mean, that's consumption, right? So my household, you know, we're two middle class, we had two middle class incomes before I retired a couple of years ago. And so our consumption was, you know, 70, 80,000, 90,000, maybe more a year. I don't know. It was somewhere in that range. That is a huge amount of consumption compared to the people that you're talking about that might be living in West Africa or East Africa or, or the Middle East or wherever. And, you know, their consumption might be the equivalent of a dollar a day. So, you know, 400 bucks a year or something, even for a family less than $2,000 a year. Where right. I was, the average, I mean, they're the, the West, the poorest country in uh, the Western hemisphere and the average income for the entire country is $700 a year. That's US, US dollar equivalents, basically. Like that's so little compared to, you know, people in the United States. Yeah. And so then the question is, you know, how, how does a person live in a society continue to live in a society, is it even possible to continue spending, you know, 20,000 a year, 30, 40, 50, 60, whatever thousand a year? And, um, or is there a way to direct that money so that good things actually start happening? Like, there's this idea that, for example, for those people who are uh, whole food plant-based vegans, for example, suppose you are buying things not from the general store, but you're buying things from other vegans. And so, you know, oh, hey, they're going to, they're not going to buy animal products or whatever. And even they might buy stuff from vegans. But at, a, at a, a certain point, there's a limit to that. I mean, even if it's one or two degrees out that eventually people are going to participate in, in the, the world economy. And the other idea is that, um, well, what if you're buying, what if your neighbor has a homestead and they, they have this fully organic, you know, no, no fossil fuel inputs or anything, farm, all vegetables, you know, no animal, uh, whatever animals are there are not there for using. They, they're just there because, you know, feces is good fertilizer, you know, and they're running around on their own free and whatever, free range. They're, they're, they're just free, totally free. Um, so you buy stuff from them. Maybe they buy stuff from you and you're supporting them. So you're really supporting something good, but can you really get your ecological footprint negative? I mean, maybe if you plant a whole lot of trees or mm -hmm. if you go and you, you lease this land that was gonna be cut down, the trees were gonna cut down and you lease it and you protect it with a group of people maybe. You know, so maybe there are ways to protect bits and pieces but, um, and that goes again back to Arthur's scenario where, yeah, if you start this a long time ago, then you might be able to come overshoot, come back down and then have this little mm -hmm. wavery thing. But now we're in a situation where, whew, 
we're going to really have to, um, we're going to have to really all become like organic gardeners fast <laughs> so that our well, consumption yeah. comes way down. And this is where, going back to my original point, I don't think technology solves our problems. Like part of the reason that those of us living in Western countries um, use so many more resources is because of the high standard of living that we've built on the idea of progress. You know, air conditioning, indoor plumbing, um, you know, highway systems, transportation, all of those things that we think of as good things, um, many of which have extended life, you know, a lot. Um, those are all incredibly resource intensive and yet they're portrayed as a, you know, we talk about development, developing, you know, um, you know, industrializing nations and bringing development, global development, like development, development, development. It's like this, this good thing without questioning, you know, are we really looking at it from a systems perspective? Are there detrimental impacts that can come from this? Are there long-term negative implications, which I think there are, you know, it's clearly our climate change, our resource extraction. Um, and I'm not saying we can't have, you know, there's a lot of talk about sustainable development as well. Um, and I think, I do actually think that if we thought carefully and chose our actions very wisely, that it would be possible to strike a balance between, you know, having this development, this progress, these modern conveniences, and doing it in a manner that keeps our footprint small. Um, I, and I think a really good example, so the when I went to Haiti, um, the place I went was this vegan reforestry camp, basically. It was called Sadana Forest. And they have a location in Haiti, in Kenya, and in India as well. And they basically, they do a lot of things, but they really view themselves as a model of sustainable ecological living. And from my experience there and what I know about their location in India as well, I really do think that if you live there, that, and there are some long-term volunteers that sort of live there, that, that they really do have a model in which I would say it is, truly sustainable and you actually are have a, a maybe a negative footprint overall and they do this by planting so the main mission is planting food forests and they view food forests as being a great way to feed the world because if you think about it a single tree an apple tree a peach tree can produce so much more food than a single corn plant or a single any other type of our agriculture and trees sequester carbon they're incredibly good for the planet and the environment um and so and and reforestry efforts are also extremely important so you know we spent our days there planting hundreds of little trees and going out into the community and helping people plant trees that will hopefully feed the local community as well. Um, and then while you're there, you know, they ask that you not, all the food served is plant-based. They ask that you not use or bring any plastic in, of any kind, basically, into that environment. Um, they have composting toilets and they have a great system where they do their own composting and vegetable scraps and you know bathroom stuff gets really well composted and then they use that to plant trees so it's very very low carbon footprint i mean very low ecological footprint in general not and i don't think it's possible to have no footprint but i would say the benefits of what they're doing with their time living there and being on the planet outweigh any impacts that their footprint has in the other direction. Um, and I, so, so I do think that there are places like that that are examples of how if we really wanted to live in an ecologically sustainable way, it would be entirely possible. Um, the problem is, can we do that with the population that we have? Um, and, you know, I don't think most people would go for that. And then, and then there's the question of like, 
well, does everyone want to, you know, spend their life planting trees and not having running water and bathrooms and composting stuff, you know? And that's, that's a question I think about a lot too, especially as vegans, you know, we hear the argument of like, you know, well, you can't, you know, we need global trade to, you know, get your bananas that you vegans like to eat. You eat a lot of stuff from foreign places in the world, you know, like that's kind of something that I've heard people say a lot before. And my response has been in those situations, you know, well, I'm not against global trade. Like I, I, you know, right now we're not moving to a society where everyone has to produce their own food. Um, so what I don't, so I think it's possible to live in an ecologically sustainable way. What I don't know is if it's possible to live in an ecologically sustainable way and have society and the jobs and the opportunities and the travel and the, all the other things that we like about our society as well. Like I don't, I wonder if those are inherently contradictory, like by nature of everyone living in cities, then you have to have people that have vast farms that are producing lots of food for people in cities that aren't, ha you know, don't have the time or skills to grow their own food. Um, so maybe the answer is if we want to be sustainable on this planet, we have to give up, you know, and this relates to our current future. Maybe we have to give up our globalized travel based, you know, industrial city based society. And we do have to go back to living on small plots of land and being self-sufficient or able to in small communities, able to grow and produce our own food. Um, maybe that is the only way. I don't know. This reminds me a lot of things. So I'm going to give a hopefully yeah. not too long response, but the, I think I'll go backwards on this. So the first is, you know, what you started talking about was what Lester Brown called plan B mm -hmm. 2.0. So plan B 2.0, basically, you know, we use industry and um, solar panels and everything, and we just go after it a hundred percent and we can, we can get it, we can get it, we can get there, you know, with techno technology and know-how and we, we can get there. And then, um, you know, there's a lot of people that think this is too late, sorry, it's, we're way too late for this. And so this one by um, Pat Murphy is called Plan C. And Plan C, you can see the people cooperating and it says community survival strategies for peak oil and climate change. And we can talk about peak oil as well. And Basically, he's talking about um, communities, like small, small, small community neighborhoods. He's basically talking about neighborhoods. And Michael Schumann has written a book about, you know, small towns called Going Local, about creating uh, self-reliant communities in a global age, which is not quite Plan C, but it's kind of close to Plan C. And then finally, Rob Hopkins out of the UK has written one called the transition handbook. And basically it's showing a, a neighborhood transitioning from the way it is now to basically little like eco villages, but mm -hmm. you don't, you don't actually go anywhere. You just stay where you're at and you and your neighbors just make yourselves into an eco village. And this actually brings up two other points real quick. One is, um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and when they stopped sending oil to Cuba, Cuba had to grow all their own food really fast without farm implements. And so everybody started gardening like instantly. And they brought in all these per permaculturists to teach everybody how to garden and make food forests. And um, Pat Murphy of the Plan C book also sponsored this DVD called The Power of Community, which is probably available for free online. Um, but again, the idea that people don't have to move. And this goes back to my final book that I was <laughs> I pulled off the shelf real fast, which is Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. And Daniel basically describes the difference between um, the culture of the, the indigenous peoples and our ancestors, right? And how humans evolved for the first you know, million years before the advent of of um, uh, you know, intensive agriculture where people really stayed put. I mean, not just like seasonal agriculture, like some of the, the, the peoples who lived in the, the US Southwest prior to the US, you know, they might 
even in Michigan and whatnot, you might have a, a garden, but that, that wasn't your one thing. You, you would still go and find food elsewhere and you'd find berries and everything. But the idea of Ishmael and, and history is just that humans evolved in communities of between maybe 50 and 150, somewhere in that range for mm -hmm. all of time. And that's how people lived. And so instead of being locked inside in these rooms that you and I are in, and everybody, you know, <laughs> basically is in, mm -hmm. people were always outside. Then they were with their brothers and their sisters, the older and younger, and their parents and their aunts and uncles and their kids and their grandparents and grand and like this big extended family. And they were with them all the time. And everybody relied on everybody for everything. And they made a living together. Mm -hmm. And that was sustainable for a million years. I mean, it's not, it's not, we don't have to search secret technological places for the answers on how we can live sustainably, you know, sustainably on this planet, just like you were mentioning about your trip. We just have to remember <laughs> that we can do it, but it's a community that does it. It's not individuals, you know, and it's not necessarily cities. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's me and the 10 how the 10 homes around me and the 50 people that live in those 10 homes all together, you know, and yeah. we can on our, we have, you know, all together, maybe 40 acres of land. And that's plenty, we, we could grow all the food we needed. I mean, we don't really have the storage set up, you know, we need to do that. We don't have the trees, the fruit trees growing. I mean, my wife and I have 10, maybe, but they're small, and they, they don't produce a whole lot. But staying where you're at, if you're at somewhere where you can actually grow food. Like if I was in a high rise, I don't think I'd want to stay there. Right. Um, but um, I mean, I, I think that's a possibility for the future. And that, that's the future I think is most likely that we have this very, very positive future in front of us. And it's kind of a combination of this permaculture eco village experience that you had. I also had a permaculture experience when I did my um, permaculture design course which was in Belize about 10 or 12 years ago. And um, that was vegan permaculture as well, because I know sometimes, uh, sometimes people will, I, I've heard vegans argue that permaculture is bad because it requires the use of animals. It doesn't. There's veganic permaculture, which is like yep. half of all the permaculturists are veganic and the other half are non-veganic. And what they do with animals is they have the animals on the land, but then, you know, they will eat those animals, um, which it's, a, I mean, it, it's, it's a whole lot better than factory farms. That's, that's, I mean, at least the quality of life is good life, even though I believe the science proves that humans are herbivores and not, did not evolve eating meat at any point in history. And only, you know, once fire was in the, invented, and, and maybe, you know, some dead animal was next to the fire and they were like, hey, that's edible. Wow, you can actually eat that, you know, because you don't want to eat rotting animal. Humans don't eat rotting animal. You don't eat that. Nobody does that. So we didn't evolve. I mean, do you have a perspective on that? I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, I've gone back and forth on whether we are omnivores or herbivores. Um, when I interviewed Milton Mills for the Climate Diet Summit, and he went into a lot of detail, he actually shared some new science about enzymes at the cellular level and the location of those enzymes in our mitochondria and um, that I had not heard before that was making a more convincing case as to why we are obligate herbivores and not even omnivores. However, like, I also think when we talk about the discussion of what we are meant to eat, that we have to be, well, A, really careful with what that means. Because from a, an evolutionary perspective, I think all that means is that we haven't evolved as quickly as our diet has changed. So, and that's how I feel about processed foods. Like when we, when we say, see that sugar and all these highly processed foods make us sick and unhealthy and clearly they cause diabetes and heart disease and all these problems. To me, that's just because our diet has changed more quickly than our evolution has happened. So that- It doesn't seem to me that there's been a whole lot of human evolution since the advent of civilization really because 
there's there doesn't seem to be a lot of pressure selective pressure because everybody almost everybody seems to live to reproductive age i mean there's so right. there's well, so there seems to be so little in fact it it seems like it seems like even people that are not particularly healthy and if if in any other species in any place outside of evolution there would have been selection where those folks wouldn't have been as reproductively su successful. And so mm -hmm. that trait would have vanished. But now it almost seems the opposite of that. Like, So this is a very complex, <laughs> very complex thing that I've looked into a little bit. Um, but my understanding is that we are learning more. And I don't, I do not fully understand it, but whether it's theories about there's like the grandmother theory or but but basically that we do possibly have an evolutionary basis for people living longer than reproductive age because we do we live way past reproductive age at this point and have for quite some time I mean you know um I read a book a long time ago called like the seven daughters of Eve that talked about you know way back, you know, women lived on average to, you know, 25 or the ripe old age of 30 years or whatever. Um, but even then, that's still, um, you know, like it, it's, it's a lot more complex. And I think our understanding of genetics, especially epigenetic influences and generational um, factors continues to change a lot. And so I have seen a lot of theories suggesting that we a, are actually continuing to evolve and that it is not just about reproductive age. That's kind of what I had used, had thought. Um, and I'm, I do not know enough about this and have not looked enough into it recently to be, to adequately explain or describe anything. Um, other than I have heard this, there's one theory put forth about the grandmother theory that like, having multi-generations or, you know, that there's a selective pressure to have um, people live to a much older age so that they have grandchildren because of this theory that grandchildren then help keep children safe so that they'll live to sort of, so, and again. Grandparents help the, keep the grandkids safe. Exactly. And so there is actually a, a reason that we have, because I've wondered about this a lot, like what is the evolutionary basis at all for us to live anywhere near as long as we do? Well, I um, certainly think that this, this that you're describing has been around for hundreds of thousands of years, though, because families lived in three, at least three generations for a very long time. Yeah. And the, the, yes. the grandparents would take care. I mean, especially if you had three or four daughters or five daughters and each one of them had three or four da children at the same time you know you're going to have a lot of I mean a lot of them are going to die the population is going to reach a certain number 150 or whatever and you're going to split off into another family unit another band whatever but yeah I, I mean I think that pressure has been there for a long time but yeah I'm not saying that's new but I'm saying that our research about that has showed that our understanding of genetics is actually a lot more complex than just oh, sure. living to reproductive age yeah and if you bring in epigenetics that is a you know now, what is epigenetics so epigenetics is not about our genes you know mutations or you know things like that explicitly changing it's the idea that we can have genes but different environmental pressures can turn them on or off. So silencing certain genes or turning them on and that those epigenetic changes can be passed on to generations. So this is a very, it's a much newer, I mean, it's not even that new at this point, but still a relatively new idea that we're learning about. And there is some evidence to suggest that, you know, changes like if you had a grandparent that grew that, you know, was alive during, you know, a famine or something that their being alive at that time could have silenced or turned on or off certain genes having to do with metabolism, for example, and that then you can find those same changes passed on through grandchildren even though they're not living in that same environmental pressure that they'll still have those same genes turned on or off. 
So a lot of our understanding of genetics is now not even about, oh, mutations or random selection or uh, you know, natural selection. It's much, much more complex. So all that to say, from my cursory glance into genetics um, is that I think it's a little simplistic to say that a lot of evolution hasn't happened over the last 10,000 years um, because our understanding of genetics is much more complex. But big picture evolution, like, yeah, we're still homo sapiens and have been for a long time. Um, our, our basic functioning hasn't changed a lot. That That is true. So, but, um, so where, where it gets complex is I, and I, I don't know, but I don't know that that's evidence that just because we're living past reproductive age, you know, we're not continuing to evolve. I think evolution, in some cases, it's much quicker when we talk about epigenetics and stuff. Um, in some cases, it is more, you know, slower. But either way, I think it's really clear, going back to my original point, that our evolution has not caught up with the high consumption, processed food, diet world that we are living in. So going back to what we're meant to eat, it's clear that we are a very adaptive species and we have been able to survive because at times we did eat and cook meat and all those things. Um, but just because we could, A, doesn't mean that we should, um, and, and B, doesn't mean that we're evolved to do it in the long term. Like when, when you don't live very long, I mean, this is another example, I think, you know, Milton has talked about this, but when we don't live very long, it can be adaptive. If we're worried about starvation, it's adaptive for us to be able to consume cooked meat to get the calories we need to survive. But that's not the position the vast majority of people are in today. And so when we are eating animal-based foods, they're causing us chronic disease because we're not adapted to, to deal with that in the long term. Whereas like, if you're worried about trying to make it through the winter, you're not worried about living to 100 or whatever chronic disease might come from your body being unable to process these foods. So yeah, whether we are really biologically omnivores or herbivores, I'm not 100% certain I lean towards herbivore at this point, but I also think that we are very adaptive and in different environments, we clearly can eat meat without it, you know, immediately making us sick when we cook it, you know? Um, so I think it's hard to say that we are absolutely not omnivores. Um, so I, I think the bigger question when it comes to diet is, what we should do here and now, not what we did and could do in the past. I have two reflections that you might want to respond to. One is, as far as evolutionary pressure on Homo sapiens in civilization, mm -hmm. I mean, there, there have been a few evolutionarily, evolutionary changes somewhat recently that are noticeable. For example, light skin was an evolutionary change and um, mm -hmm. lactose, lactose tolerance mm -hmm. was an evolutionary change. So oh. those were a couple that are noticeable by science. Yeah. And then there are ones that are probably not noticeable from all the previous pandemics that have ever happened, the Black Death and all those, that there was selection based on not only... Um, immune system strength, but also on perhaps intelligence as far as, uh, hey, maybe I want to so, uh, physical distance, do some physical distance for a few months and just, you know, me and my family stay off on my farm and uh, do our surf thing here, you know, versus the folks that were like, no, I don't need to do that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I don't think this current pandemic that we're in, it, it doesn't feel like it's of that scale 
that it's going to cause a, a big, you know, that's the, here's a trait that we're, that's going to leave. But, um, sickle cell anemia is a good example of a, a, an adaptive trait as well. Okay. Um, Tell us about that one. So the, we think of sickle cell anemia as like a disease, but having one of the sickle cell alleles genetically was actually an adaptive response to, um, I believe, malaria in regions where malaria was really common. It actually, uh, it's been a while, so hopefully I don't say something very biologically wrong here. Um, <laughs> remember learning about this a while ago, but I, I haven't looked at it in a long time. But I think having one of the sickle cell alleles makes you more resistant to malaria or something along those lines. Um, but I know that sickle cell is not just a disease, but it actually came about as an adaptive trait to another disease. The other point I was going to get to is about bananas. Mm -hmm. And yes, my household is a banana household. I eat at least one banana every day. We consume at least two or three bananas every day. And I'm okay with if there's a future where bananas are not available, either not having the bananas or growing them somewhere a whole lot closer, like in a greenhouse or something. Um, mm -hmm. I certainly find it almost painful to imagine that the things I buy or, or not even I buy, because if, when I buy stuff, I'm paying the people at the grocery store and they're buying different stuff, right? So mm -hmm. it, it's only one step from my purchase to somebody else's purchase and they're buying stuff mm -hmm. that's coming out of the Amazon. For example, the beef that's coming out of the Amazon, the, the soy, apparently there's all this soy that's growing on the, the horrible soil. I mean, the Amazon, the rainforest has all the nutrients in it and you take down the rainforest and burn it or, or chop it up and send it to the lumber mills and the soil is not very rich at all. I mean, it's depleted quickly within a few years, but the beef, the soy, um, the, the um, palm oil, the sugar cane. I mean, apparently these are some of the huge crops and you know, I'm, I'm okay not doing any of those, but that doesn't mean that if I stop purchasing that when I go to the grocery store, that who or the gas station or wherever i mean every dollar i spend basically is giving someone else money to buy whatever they want for food and so um mm -hmm. but I, I i don't i don't have a problem with that i mean i'm i'm i would i would really love the idea of being able to um, have what's called the 100 mile diet where you only eat things that have grown within 100 miles of you and they're all whole whole food plant-based, whole plant-based food. So whole foods, mm -hmm. tomatoes and potatoes and, and rices and beans and corns and, you know, all, all the, all the stuff. I love that idea. I would, I would be more than happy to do that, but that's, that's a family decision. A lot of times, you know, that's not an individual decision. Well, and for me, and this is something I've been thinking about with all this, you know, I, I live in Kansas city. My parents live about an hour away, more out in the country they're very into gardening or at least my mom is and they love she loves growing and would love to be self-sufficient and grow all of her own food she can do it without pesticides it's fresh it's organic veganic you know all of this and i have very little interest in gardening like i like that idea of being able to eat you know fresh organic locally grown produce but i'm one of those people that like playing in the dirt, remembering to water plants, like all of that is very much not my thing. I like spending my time doing other things. Um, and so that's, it's a little difficult for me. I'm one of the, I, I'm in there going, well, you know, we might need to be going back to this world and it might be better if everyone had, you know, their lawn full of vegetables and was producing a lot more of their own food. But then I'm one of those people, that that's not what I want to spend my time doing. And I very much depend on the, the trade and the other people doing that for me. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, like I do my best to eat the organic and local and of course vegan um, products and everything, but 
is that really sustainable? And do I really know where all that's coming from? And would it be better? And, you know, should we be moving to that place where everyone's growing a little bit of their own food? Maybe. And, um, but I, I'm one of those people that might not be able to feed myself then. Well, you know, I could see a future for you, for example, where you and perhaps a future spouse are living near your parents and your parents' nearest neighbors are all, you know, growing food and you are, hmm, the professor, you know, the teacher, because there's all the kids, right? I mean, there's going to be kids there. And if they're not right there, they're going to be right in the neighbor, right next door community, or maybe you're going to have five or 10 communities, uh, neighborhoods is what I'm talking about, five or 10 neighborhoods of say 100 people that, you know, they all send kids to a central school and, you know, there's Serena and, you know, she's teaching them bioethics and, and maths and, and, you know, everything. So I, I, am, I don't imagine the future is going to be everybody doing farming 100% of the time, but I don't think that's, that's realistic. Um, but if you go back, you said you liked reading um, Little House on the Prairie, for example. Mm -hmm. And in those stories, I mean, you know, there, there were other things that people were doing. There were people who made tools and did, did all sorts. There were teachers and right. various different, I mean, there's various things that people want, right? You know, people want their kids to be taken care of. And we know right now, I mean, at least from the parent perspective, I have a lot of parents on Facebook and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm ready to be done with this homeschooling bit. You know, so, so a, uh -huh. teacher, a teacher has a, uh, has a future career, you know. Um, I think the question is, if you look at places like East Africa, where, where the, the, the ground has basically been denuded, you know, what is, what careers do remain really? And I think teachers are one of the, one of the ones that do remain, especially if they can teach important stuff like, Hey, you can grow a food for, forest and here's what you need to be aware of when you're growing a food forest, you know, and this is, you don't want to grow these two things next to each other because, and if, if you get blight on this, oh, this is what you're going to have to do. And you're, you know, I mean, that, that's, that's some important information right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But also, you know, like we recently watched a film called the, um, the boy who harnessed the wind, which is based on the book of the same title. Mm -hmm. And it was all about, it was East Africa and they had a drought and um, it, it was entirely, they were way over carrying capacity for the land. And the people all had to move away and the government was just taking the resources and selling them to other countries, like the, the food that was being grown, the corn or wheat or whatever. And, but the boy learned about, he, he was you know a young teenager at the time, he learned how to build a, a um, a wind powered water pump and that wind powered water pump was able to irrigate a large enough area that a small group of 20 or 30 people were able to stay on the land and they didn't have to leave and so you know there there are at least in the future i imagine that there's a lot of other occupations I mean, not instantly though. I mean, because people don't have their food, food forests yet. So mm -hmm. in the short term, get your food forest going with your neighbors, you know, so you, you depend on each other, learn how to store the stuff. And, and then obviously, I mean, I'm already doing the teaching thing. I don't know if I told you, but in our neighborhood, I have a, there's a first grader and the first grader has been home alone with just the, the teenage brother and sisters and, you know, 10 hours home alone with the brother and sister not getting a lot of learning done. And so he's, he's part of our, um, our, uh, our bubble now. Mm -hmm. And as two families, we are, we are a bubble. And um, so he comes over and I, I teach him like an hour a day on how to read and how to write and how to do his math. And we watched a Bill Nye video today and we looked at Google Earth and did a little geography. And mm -hmm. so someone that is effective at teaching and patient that that's a that's a really useful skill yeah that's a good point did you have other thoughts on ai before we wrap up because 
I have a little game for you, which is called um, uh, 50 names. And you're going to respond to 50 names. Are you up for that? I'm up for it. And I don't have any, like I said, I'm, I'm quite critical of AI and I a, don't think it, we're going to get to any of those worlds and B, I don't want any of those scenarios. Hmm. Well, to me, it sounds like you, you are um, in the one that Max would call the reversion, which is trying to get rid of, not get rid of, but saying, you know, enough is enough and let's just let's just use what we got, you know, uh -huh. we've got enough. We've yeah. got millions and billions, almost built what billions of cars. We've got billions of cell phones. We don't, do we really need to manufacture anymore? I mean, we've, we've got so many books. I mean, my, my house is full of books. So we have plenty of stuff already. Yeah. And so I, I don't think it's really reversion. I mean, I don't think it's going back to Mennonite and Amish living. That was the well, part I didn't like. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I think it's a utopia, but it's a utopia of a different sort. It's it's a, a plan C sort of utopia, really. It's kind of a permaculture, a veganic permaculture tribe, not tribal, but family neighborhood. It's a neighborhood organization for the future. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so are you ready for the game? I am. Okay, now again, here's the game. The game is I'm gonna give you names of people. You are going to say either pass if you don't know anything about them. If they're a friend of yours, you can just say friend so you don't have to say your perspective on them. Okay. Um, but if it's someone that you, you know, are like, wow, you know, I love them and they, they, they're, they inspire me, they are, they are inspiring to me or uh, wow, they really have interesting things to say. Just just say a short few words or something. And I, may, I just made this list today, so I don't know I don't know how 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 it will go. Okay. I'm gonna start I'm gonna start with the hard ones, and then I'm gonna go maybe to the easier ones. I don't know. I have about fifty though. So and here we go. Are you ready? Author, wait, these are author names or book names? Pe people. People. Okay. Uh, past and current. You know, contemporary. So. Um, and if anybody's watching on YouTube, if you want to um, write down any names that I missed, like, oh man, you wrote this, you had this whole list of men, I thought you were gonna have this name and you didn't have it. Like, where'd that name go? And I'm like, oh, well, I guess I didn't know. Okay, here we go. We'll, we'll, we'll start with fun. Rold, okay. Rold Dow. Love him. J.R.R. Tolkien. Okay, never got into it. C.S. Lewis. Haven't read. William Faulkner. Uh, pass. Charles Dickens. Um, very important. <laughs> very important. Okay. Nice. Um, George Orwell. Incredibly poignant. <laughs> F. Scott Fitzgerald. Okay. John Steinbeck. Um, very poignant. Fyodor yeah. Do Dostoevsky. Pass. Uh, Franz Kafka. Pass. John Paul Sartre. Pass. Herman Melville. Um, uh, I will go pass. Ernest Hemingway. Um, interesting. Walt Whitman. Um, I'll pass. Ra Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, very ahead of his time. Nice. Farley Moat. Pass. Hmm. Bill McKibben. Um, very, a, a movement leader that gets some things very wrong. 
Um, some, some of these I don't really know. So if you just pass on all of them, it's fine. Elizabeth Colbert. Cool. I, I don't know anything about her. So I've, I've read some of her stuff. Um, yeah, it, I don't know a ton, but I remember reading at least one of her books in a class. Susan Griffith. Pass. Starhawk. Pass. Uh, Ryan Tenhouse Eisler. Pass. Megan Watterson. Pass. Diane Leaf Christensen. Pass. Jesse Bloom. Pass. Janet Mills. Pass. Heather Ashamara. Pass. Hmm. Mary Oliver. Pass. Paul Hawken. Uh, very smart. Eo Wilson. Uh, pass. Tony Morrison. Um, deep, very eye-opening. <laughs> Deepak Chopra. Um, inspiring. Vandana Shiva. Amazing, brilliant, kind, great activist. She emailed me yesterday and said she might be willing to do an interview next month. Very nice. Yeah. Jeremy Rifkin. Um, also, uh, smart. Yeah. Ralph Nader. Um, visionary. Wendell Berry. Um, cool. Von, uh, we already did Von Donna. Um, so some of these people you might know personally, and if you don't want to give a personal opinion, just say friend or past okay. or whatever. All right, here we go. Um, Jenny Brown. I've met her. Uh, Chef AJ. Love her. Michael Pollan. Um, right on some things, wrong on some others. <laughs> Jamie Oliver. Um, don't know much about. Michael Greger. I, I know him as a friend, yeah. Uh, Juliana Heaver. I don't know her super well, but have met her at Summerfest. It's actually Juliana. Uh, Miyoko Shiner. Yeah, friend, lovely woman. Neil Bernard. I've met him a couple times. Paul Watson. Interviewed him, he's... Uh, got quite the the experience in this world gary francione very brilliant i've met him a couple times rachel carson visionary head of her time uh, julia feliz broke brook don't know mm -hmm. patrice jones um i i haven't met her Seems interesting. Carol Adams. Um, I've met I've met Carol a couple times. Um, very very has some very interesting uh, books for sure. Matthew Scully. Familiar with him? Don't know him. John Robbins. Uh, familiar with his stuff? Don't know him. Jonathan Balcom. Friend. Melanie Joy. Met her a couple times. Colleen, Colleen Patrick Goudreau. Also met her a couple times. <laughs> You've met a lot of people. Ingrid Newkirk. Um, haven't met her. Very interesting person. Jane Goodall. Um, actually have met her. Have a picture Great. with her. Really nice. Um, yeah, it's a funny story if you want to hear it. But uh, I, I will. I have only two more names, and we'll okay. come back to Jane. Okay, Peter Singer. Um, have not met him. Not a fan. Carl Safina. Pass. 
Okay. And then any names that you were like, why didn't Aaron mention such and such? Um, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot more. Okay. They're not. Coming. We can play again. We can play again. Okay. <laughs> but I, I prefer I get to ask the questions because I, I would have said, oh, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Jane Goodell, tell me about your experience meeting Jane. So she came to speak in Kansas City. Um, I think I was probably about six years old and she was speaking to a pretty large audience. I think there were probably a thousand people or more. It was at, uh, I think it was at Unity Village, which is like the the origins of the Unity Church are here in Kansas City. And they used to have this children's museum called the Children's Peace Pavilion. And it was like a, like a little children's museum you could play in. And it was a, like a quite a ways from our home at that time. And so we'd driven a long ways in with some other homeschooling friends to see Jane Goodall speak. And then our intention was to go up to the Children's Museum in the same building afterwards to play there. And, and we'd all brought our packed lunches to eat. And we get up to the Children's Museum and they say that they're closed. And so we like knock on the door. We didn't know they were gonna be closed. And they're like, oh, well, Jane Goodall and her private group are eating lunch in here. So, you know, it's not open to the public today. And my mom goes, well, there's no kids playing on this stuff. Wouldn't Jane Goodall like to see real live kids using the like Peace Pavilion equipment and toys? <laughs> and they're like, just a minute, let me go ask. And they like go ask her and they're like, she says you can come in. So like a group of like three or four of us homeschooling families went in and basically got to have lunch with Jane Goodall and sit and talk with her for a little bit. <laughs> and how was that for you? I was six, so I don't remember it much beyond the picture I have with her, but uh, seems pretty cool. <laughs> Wish I was older and had gotten to speak with her more. One of my, um, uh, of, of the five places, maybe we should do this another time, but I have, I'd like you to, maybe for next time we're on together, five places in the world you would like to go and why like your number top five in your life that you would like to go and why because I can... because I, I already know my list i've done this list many many times and it, it even when i forget i end up comparing it's the same five places so um so maybe maybe for another time we'll do that because i think all that right. would be interesting yeah sounds good all right so serena not a fan of a uh, general ai and um kind of kind of uh, the plan C idea is is close to what she thinks is not bad. I mean, is that your utopia? What is your utopia, Serena? I don't even know. I mean... How do you know what you're aiming for if you don't know what your ut utopia is? I mean, generally the way I think about it, the utopia I'm aiming for is one that has lots of variability, that has lots of freedom, but not exploitation. And that's, I generally think of it that way because I don't like thinking about reduction suffering because then you get to a place where we talk about taking emotion away or not having any, you know, these various experiences. If there's no pain, well, then is there any joy? And so I, I really struggle with that idea of aiming for, you know, a world without suffering, which is why I think focusing on, you know, things like ending slavery and exploitation and domination. When I think of utopia, I think of, there's still conflict, there's still disagreements, there's still suffering, but there, there is freedom and you don't have other people or life entities forcing you to do things or killing you or harming you so that you can live life on your own terms. Oh, that's very nice. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your time with us today. Thank Me you and any viewers that might be on. <laughs> well, thank you again for having me. Interesting, very fascinating conversation. Well, thank you. It's, it was very interesting to talk to you too. And if you're viewing this, and if you haven't done the thumbs up yet, please hit thumbs up 
and subscribe and ring the bell so you get notifications next time and leave a comment, especially if there's names that I missed. I mean, I, I had a certain set of names because I know that Serena is vegan and she's familiar with animal rights activists. Um, but if there were names that you were like, wow, you've totally missed such and such, then go ahead and put that list in there and we'll, we'll, we'll maybe query Serena next time and I'll look into them as well. Thank you so much, Serena. Thank you.